What does life hold for philosophy majors? I decided to find out. Welcome to Life After Philosophy. I'm Christopher Annadale. Welcome to Life After Philosophy. My guest today is Mr. Jared Tommy. He studied philosophy with me at Conception Seminary College more than 20 years ago. And uh, to be honest, today he works at McDonald's. Jared, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I was listening to some of the past episodes and, you know, you've had a prestigious line of guests so far. I saw the, you know, the entrepreneur, the lawyer, the pastor. And uh, so now you have the McDonald's worker. So I'm the guy that uh, studied philosophy and works at McDonald's now. So <laughs> happy to be on the show, though. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for making time from your busy schedule to uh, to be with us today. This is, I suppose, the the path most expected by by the critics of philosophy, the uh, the the philosophy student to McDonald's worker pipeline. So it's only fair to take a representative here and uh, put him put him on the air. I'll puncture the joke now, I guess, and let people in on our gag that Jared is an industrial engineer, and. His uh, current title, he works as the Global Operations Manager, Strategy and Standards at the McDonald's Corporation. He's been in, an industrial engineer for about 12 years now, and his recent work focuses on discrete event simulation modeling. So That's right. Uh, working for McDonald's Corporation, but as an engineer, I'm really interested since our association was at Conception Seminary College back in 2004, 2005, I'm uh, sorry, I should say as well. Jared's a 2005 graduate of Conception Seminary College with a Bachelor's of Arts degree in philosophy. And he's since gone on to earn, I think, an MBA and an engineering degree. And uh, Jared, why don't you just pick this up wherever you like, either with your education back then or with your work now or with some of the pathway in between, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, I was at Conception Seminary College from fall of 02 to May of 2005, and prior to coming to Conception, I had spent a year as a chemical engineering major at Kansas State University. So I had a few, uh, you know, a little bit of an engineering background, you know, just the under some of the, you know, like Calc 1, 2, 3, you know, some of the introductory engineering classes before coming to Conception. But uh, I was, I came to Conception testing out a vocation to the priesthood. Spent three wonderful years at Conception, which included more than a few classes with you and uh, philosophy classes. And after I graduated in 2005 with my philosophy degree, I decided to take a pause from priestly formation as I was uh, sort of figuring out what to do after a philosophy degree, after you know taking a breath from seminary studies. Uh, it, it became kind of this circuitous journey, but uh, basically I, I actually started uh, pursuing a licentiate program, long distance licentiate program in bioethics through a school called Regina Apostolorum in Rome. And I did that like uh, right after my wife and I, my wife and I were married in 2006, by the way. So obviously, spoiler alert, the dating process went very well. <laughs> with her and uh, and we got married uh you know a year after basically uh, I graduated from conception and yeah go ahead I remember I think having uh having 4th of July picnic with you at your home in Ravenwood at one point in time uh during my, my later years at conception it's all coming back to me now the the, the memories <laughs> are flooding back so please carry yeah, on yeah so it, yeah it was a uh, yeah, so the timeline kind of went, you know, Emily and I got married, and then uh, shortly after that, like, uh, so we were married in, in May uh, of 2006, and then in December of 2006, we found out we were pregnant with our first set of twins. So, spoiler alert for the first uh, set listeners. of twins. <laughs> yeah, we have <laughs> two sets of twins, which I'll get to in a second. But uh, so it was during that time when I was doing the long distance, I, I had just started the long distance licentiate program. You know, I knew I wasn't done with, with school yet. But in the meantime, so Emily was working as a hospital social worker. I was 
doing some substitute teaching. I was also teaching adult basic education classes in the evening, so GED classes essentially, while I was doing this long distance program uh, through the Regina Apostolorum. Reality hit pretty quick, right? When you when you find out you're you know you're newly married, you have a, a you find out we were, we first found out we were pregnant, right? And then so that was uh, we didn't quite know yet uh, out of the gate that we were having twins, but finding out that we were pregnant said uh, okay maybe I should find a real job here uh, instead of you know substitute teaching doing sort of these odds and ends things. And at that it was at that time in uh, early 2007, so January February 2007, where the communications posi uh, director position came open at Conception. So uh, they were looking for somebody, obviously, that was kind of familiar with the institution and could do communications work within the development office at Conception Abbey and Seminary College. So it was a good fit. We moved back, or I moved back to the area. We we eventually found a house in Ravenwood, but that whole deal was a process I won't get into. So Emily was living in in Manhattan. I was living in you know Conception for a while while we we're looking for a house. She's increasingly more pregnant, you know, during these weeks, and you know trying to come up and find a house. And uh, during that time, we found out we were actually having twins, and so it was kind of you know it's like oh, instant wow. family, you know, yeah. Yeah. And so we were like supposed to close on the house the week that she ended up having our oldest daughters. And so it was just, it was just this, this crazy whirlwind of trying to move. And, and she had the, um, our daughters here in Wichita, Kansas, where we're both originally from. And that's where her doctor was. Uh, but then, you know, having to drive back and forth to try to move. And also we needed to, I was trying to paint some of the rooms and update things a little bit. So it was just, <laughs> it was, a, it was a little crazy, but uh, we finally got settled in and uh, began really digging in as um, communications director at Conception spent some, another almost four years uh, doing that work, uh, which, which was great. And, you know, got to spend some more time with you while while you were still there. And during that time, you know, I, I kind of knew in the back of my mind that, okay, now I've got this family and I have a philosophy degree. I'm doing nonprofit development work. What else can I do? And again, I, I so I stopped, I stopped the, the um, long distance bioethics work just because it wasn't practical, you know, to go back and forth to Rome with a young family and that sort of thing. Right. And so what I ended up doing is is I, I thought, well, let me go see what Northwest Missouri State has to offer. I that's where I started courses coursework for an MBA, working towards an MBA, which I, I got uh it I finished in the summer of 2010, uh, which was also when our second set of twins was born. So uh in my last basically my last semester at Northwest Missouri State. We found out that we were pregnant with our second set of twins. And uh, quick aside there, um, so Emily actually went in for a pretty early sonogram. It was January. She was only like three weeks along. And um, yeah. so the, the sonotech was looking around, and she didn't know we already had a set of twins. And so she was asking us, uh, do twins run in your family? And we were like, oh, my God, are we having <laughs> twins again? You know? And she said, yeah. oh. Well, I think I see more. I'm like, how many more? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, was I was just thinking. That was literally my my reaction. She's like, uh, I think I see four or five. I'm like, what? Like, how does that even happen without fertility drugs? Let alone, you know, like we weren't even really trying, you know. And, and she's Good like, heavens. well, uh, I, you know, I'm a little bit new, and so let me go get the doctor and get her to come in and and take a look. And so the doctor comes in. And sure enough, she's looking around. She says, you know, it, it does look like four to me, but, you know, it's very early. So we're going to have you come in in a couple of weeks to get a better look on things. And so for two weeks, you can imagine what kind of thoughts are going through our minds. You know, we're we already have we have two two year olds basically at that time or two and a half year olds. And we are sitting there thinking we're going to have potentially four more children, you know, newborns. <laughs> so yeah, see, like, four, four, four kids in four kids in four years is, uh, is, is anybody's maximum. 
Yeah, it, it's yeah. it's just uh, it was kind of crazy, you know, thinking like, oh, do we have a reality TV show? I was thinking like, what kind of vehicle do I even get to drive <laughs> my family around? Do I need to get a CDL? You know, <laughs> so but uh, so we came in a couple weeks later and um, so the doctor was looking around, said, yeah, sure enough, it looks like four gestational sacs, but only two developing uh, embryos. And so, you know, it's just funny because of the perspective, like we went from saying, oh, my God, are we having uh, twins again to saying oh well thank god we're only having twins again oh wow. of course not yeah you know not, not not because we wouldn't have been you know more than thrilled for for the new lives but just uh from the standpoint of the health of the children the health of you know twins is already high enough risk pregnancy as it is and so but thankfully right. you know god is good and um all the girls were were healthy and so but um the point of bringing all this up is that with that second set of twins, you know, Emily and I are both from around the, the Wichita area, which for your listeners is about four and a half, five hours away from Northwest Missouri, where we were living at the time. So we knew eventually that we were going to move back closer to home to be closer to, you know, friends and family. But having that second set of twins really just sort of accelerated that decision-making process. So it was at oh, that time. Absolutely. Yeah, things were going well at conception, you know, but I was about to graduate with my MBA and and the timing just made sense to say, okay, let's take a look and see, you know, let's let's make a move back closer to family because uh, we were running out of arms between the two of us. Um, <laughs> and uh, so so it was at that time that we started looking for uh, looking for work closer to Wichita. And so this was 2010. and if you'll remember, you know, many people will probably still remember, you know, the country was going through a fairly significant recession starting in 2008. And so, you know, there's still much of the hangover from that in 2010. And turns out there weren't too many employers that were looking for somebody with a philosophy degree, an MBA and nonprofit development work. So I, I interviewed for a few jobs. Long story short, Emily, who is a social worker, it ended up, she found a job working in El Dorado, which is about 45 minutes outside of Wichita. Uh, and I began doing a sales job. And so we moved back. We got back to Wichita. I was doing a sales job for a year. Emily was working for the state as a social worker, driving back and forth from El Dorado, 45 minutes each way in a car that didn't have any air conditioning. We had four daughters under the age of four. And after about a year of doing that, we sort of had the conversation of like, okay, something's got to give here. Do we, do we want to keep doing this? This doesn't, doesn't seem like a trajectory that we want to continue on very long. So uh, the company I worked for was, was, was really great, uh, but I, I had done a year of sales work was enough to make me realize that I wasn't really cut out to be a salesperson. You know, I just it didn't really fit with me. Right. And so, and now I have four daughters and it's sort of already looming in the horizon that, gosh, you know, eventually I may have to potentially pay for like four weddings, you know? So like, <laughs> and I, <laughs> so which is a daunting mm. thought, right? And, and yeah. I also did not like the feeling of being sort of, beholden to the whims of the economy you know I, I just felt like i i didn't i wasn't comfortable with my employability we'll say that and so through those conversations emily and i had you know we, we decided that i should go back to school yet again and uh start pursuing an engineering degree i started thinking you know i really kind of enjoyed engineering and uh, maybe that just never really left my blood and so I looked at Wichita State University what programs they had to offer yeah sort of stumbled across industrial engineering which to be honest I really wasn't familiar with back when I was an engineering student I really I didn't know what I thought in industrial engineering was but uh, whatever I thought it was 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 wrong and so huh. For the listeners, you know, basically, and industrial engineer, for those who don't know, it's, it's it's really geared towards like process improvement, efficiencies, you know, um, operational excellence. Think, trying to, I kind of describe it as basically trying to be a good steward of the company's resources, whether it's, you know, materials, time, 
customer goodwill, employee res resources, just basically trying to be a good steward, making things happen in the most efficient way pro uh, possible. And so that really resonated with me because as I looked back on the previous jobs that I'd held, that's the kind of things that I had actually enjoyed doing. I enjoyed improving things, making things better, finding faster, cheaper, better ways to do things. And so I decided to pursue studies at Wichita State. And in the meantime, I also was applying for jobs that were related to industrial engineering. And that's when I got my first industrial engineering related job at Spirit Aerosystems, uh, which was a huge blessing. So, Can I ask you a question real quick, Jay? Sure. Actually, two questions. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know much about en engineering, the different types of engineering, mm -hmm. industrial engineering. I have heard mm -hmm. of an MBA, but I've never gotten one or enrolled in a program. But when you talk about, you know, work on efficiency and, you know, personnel systems and finding the best way to, you know, adapt the, the company's resources to the company's goals and mission, that sounds to me like it, it, it sounds like MBA type thing, things I would associate with a business degree. I, I know there's a lot of bit talk out there about the MBA as a, as a credential in the job market. It sounds like you sort of reached the conclusion that the MBA wasn't going to do it for you in terms of actually finding a job in that job market, you know, now more than 10 years ago. What's the difference between approaching these things from like a business management perspective or from an industrial engineering perspective? So I'm really curious to know more about this. I know very little. Yes, no. So it's, it's a great question. And there certainly is some overlap. And I think what I would differentiate between the two is that so, well, first off, I would say industrial engineering ha out of out of all of the other engineering disciplines probably has the most natural overlap with business subject matter, right? So understanding organizational goals, understanding like production targets and, you know, uh, finances behind things or or budgets and whatnot, like there's probably the most natural overlap with industrial engineering and business. And so the difference being is that, you know, there's business, like when I got my MBA, I took accounting and finance and marketing classes, just kind of get a, a sense of overall, like what are the different functions of business? Mm -hmm. Now, industrial engineering is more scientific tools that are actually geared towards understanding production or process mechanics. So a lot of it would be geared towards like manufacturing processes. And like, so you may have heard things like statistical process control or Six Sigma, which is, there, there's a lot of statistics involved with, with industrial engineering it, that stems from basically when, when you take any process, whether it's a manufacturing process or some sort of business process or Say you go to a grocery store, you you fill your cart, you stand in line, the person checks you out, whatever the process may be, all processes are pretty much subject to some sort of variability, right? And mm -hmm. so this is kind of where the statistics come in and, and you can quantify different pieces of the process in terms of their variability and how they function. And what industrial engineering does is kind of use some of those tools and sort of looks at the process mechanics and how the variability interacts between the pieces of the process and say, okay, how might we make this process faster? Or if I'm Toyota, how, how am I going to produce cars as efficiently as possible, as cheaply as possible with as high of a quality as possible, things like that. So, so wow. industrial engineers more kind of like hard, hard science, like tools that enable you to actually enact the 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 improvements to bring about a result and then the mba is really kind of giving you some context as far as like how does that production process sit within the overall function of the business and that sort of thing so oh i don't know if that's helpful or if that's clear but um that's that's kind of a, a differentiation there yeah. no that's great you've taught me a lot uh, this is the kind of thing that as a, as a humanities guy you know i i read plato and then i teach plato and uh <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of occasion to think about the difference between, you know, a sort of general business approach and a really scientific engineering process balancing efficiency against other other uh, desirable outcomes in terms of the overall business. I, I could ask some other questions here, but why don't you go on? I, I think it seems like you still have more of the story to tell. 
Yeah, yeah. So I really fell in love with it. And and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get more into this, I'm sure. But, you know, with, with the philosophy background and just with maybe my own personality, like I just really enjoyed the challenge of being able to look at a process. So, so my first job was at Spirit, my first industrial engineering job, we'll say, um, was at Spirit Aerosystems. And so it's an, an aircraft manufacturer, aerostructures manufacturer, basically it used to be Boeing commercial back before they divested in 2005. So I got my first job, industrial engineering job there as a production control analyst. And I just, it was a completely new environment. There's this huge airplane pieces around and I supported what was called the 48 section which is if you take a 737 fuselage and chop it off right in front of the tail fin that's the 48 section so completely new environment and it was a little bit intimidating at first but I just really fell in love with with trying to understand this these new processes that were completely foreign to me and how to you know how to improve upon them and so it was great because while I was working there, I was uh, working on my industrial engineering degree and and actually Spirit agreed to pay for me to get my master's program. So it was this, this really great time because I had context to apply what I've learned in the classroom. And in the classroom, I had context from real working environment to bring those examples like into the classroom. And so it was really a lot of, uh, practical learning that was going on alongside the the theoretical learning. And so I just love the the challenge of being able to take a process, try to understand it, try to figure out what are kind of the first things, I guess, or what are kind of some of the primary principles that are driving this process and like what levers do I need to tweak to make things better, you know? And so it, it was really a great fit there. And then as I, as I progressed along in my career at Spirit, I got involved in a particular type of analysis called discrete event simulation modeling. And so that's, that's another tool, another, I would say fairly common tool in an industrial engineer's tool belt is um, uh, discrete event simulation modeling. And basically what it is, you know, I mentioned the statistics of processes before. Um, basically what it is, is that you quantify a process in terms of its component pieces and you quantify the variability involved in those things. So a simple example, you know, you go to a grocery store, you fill your cart with items. Every customer in the grocery store is going to have probably a different number of items in their cart. They're going to go to a checkout line and, you know, the checkout person is going to maybe take a certain amount of time to check out each item. And then, you know, you're going to be on your way. So like as an industrial engineer, one thing I might do is study, well, when somebody comes to a store, how many items do they buy? What's, what's the average cart size? But not only the average cart size, but what is the variability in that cart size? And so I would take use statistics to sort of fit a probability distribution to a customer's cart size. Then I will look do the same thing for like the checkout time. So how long does it take to process an item, you know, knowing that sometimes you're going to have vegetables that they got to key in and things like that. So fit a probability distribution. And so what discrete event simulation modeling basically does is that it uses a random number generator to sort of sample from these probability distributions to say, okay, here's what a Tuesday afternoon at supermarket XYZ looks like. And now that I've got this sort of virtual construct of this system, now I can start pulling levers and say, what if we add a checkout person? Or what if we add a part-time checkout person during this time? So it gives you kind of, you basically are creating this sandbox that is representative of the real world process that then you can start playing in the sandbox and figuring out, you know, how to optimize the system. So I started getting into discrete event simulation modeling at uh, Spirit. After doing that for about five years um, total time at Spirit, I took a position with the United States Postal Service supporting their processing and distribution operations and then had the opportunity to, to 
essentially introduced the organization to discrete event simulation modeling. So I was just basically supporting the processing and distribution center here in Wichita, but I worked on a project where I used simulation modeling to show some, you know, fairly substantial improvements. And then I was sort of asked to take this job at the headquarters level and sort of develop a, a simulation modeling department for the entire United States Postal Service. And so I did that. Wow. Yeah. So really had a great time doing that. That was that was a lot of, uh, you know, learned a lot, really developed a lot professionally doing that. Let me ask you one question, if I might. It sounds, you, it sounds to me like you're talking about building models, right? Modeling, creating a sandbox. Is there a separation between the actual construction of the model, gathering the data, figuring out the variability, quantifying everything, putting it together, and the actually running the model? Are those two different tasks, two different steps, or is it a sort of constant synthesis and, and feedback? Just to satisfy my own curiosity. Yeah, sure. Typically, they would be kind of um, separate steps. So like with with modeling, yeah, there would be definitely a stage where you would do sort of what I would call the input analysis, where you're gathering the data, you're sort mm -hmm. of quantifying and analyzing the data, you're fitting probability distributions. And then there's the component where you're actually sort of building the logic of the model and incorporating the 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 things from the input analysis to the actual construction of the model. And then after that, you know, you press the play button on the model, there's there's a, a kind of a third stage that I would say is verification and validation. And so mm -hmm. some people might use these interchangeably, but but verification is basically verifying that the model is running as I, the modeler, intend it to run. And so in other words, like if a customer is supposed to go, you know, a drive through customer is supposed to go through a drive through they're going to the drive through They're not actually going to in-store or something like that. You know, so verification, making sure the model is mechanically working how I want it to. And right. validation then is analyzing the outputs of the model and statistically comparing the outputs of the model to what we see in the real world. And so that is, you know, can be interesting from the standpoint of if you're modeling something that is completely clean sheet, you might not have actual real world data to compare it to. But most of the time, like what I try to do is build a model, feed it with some real world conditions and sort of validate, okay, yep, my model's spitting out results that are uh, consonant with the real world. And so now I can trust my model because I use the analogy of a broken compass, right? If you're lost in the woods and you have a broken mm -hmm. compass, you're hundred percent guaranteed that you're going to get more lost. Same is true. If I have a <laughs> yeah. bad, if I have a bad model and it's right. not properly validated and I'm giving business leaders recommendations on this, it's going to be hundred percent sending them down the wrong path. Whereas if you make a decision off of say gut instinct, you, you might get lucky and get it right. You know, so Reminds me of one of my favorite Dilbert punchlines where the uh, the boss, Dilbert tells the boss that the, these these budget numbers are completely wrong. And the boss says they're the only numbers we have. Dilbert says, well, we have an infinite number of wrong numbers to yeah. choose from. So yeah, it, it yeah. reminds, it's sort of a philosophical principle about reality as the ultimate touchstone for, exactly. for modeling and for action. So yeah. it's, I, we, we got as far in your story as you, you, you were uh, going to be helping to build a, uh, a system for all of USPS. Yeah. So it, it went really well and it, it was a great opportunity for me. And uh, it was really nice that sort of my interests and the company's needs and the opportunity really intersected at the right place and time. And so I was, so I was at the uh, USPS for a total of five years. And I would say really probably about four of those years, three and a half, four of those years, um, I was kind of standing up and maybe passing around the Kool-Aid of uh, discrete event simulation, you know, kind of spreading it throughout the company. And uh, it went really well and had a great time doing that. And, and things were going good. And then we were, my wife and I, or my family and I was on vacation two years ago. And Actually, my wife saw the notification come across my phone first. A recruiter from McDonald's actually reached out to me 
And uh, so, you know, my wife picked up the phone. It's like, why is somebody from McDonald's reaching out to you? And I was like, I don't know, probably spam, you know? So, but I, yeah. I looked at the, I decided to look at the the message and I started reading the job description. It's like, oh, this is basically what I'm doing now at the postal service, but it's for McDonald's, you know, because they were wanting a, you know, manager of uh, process design and simulation modeling. And so I decided to kind of take a take a step down the rabbit hole, go through the interview process, and uh, turned out to be a pretty good rabbit hole. And um, now I've been at McDonald's for two years and uh, really have enjoyed the work. I've enjoyed the culture, the people. I get the opportunity to, to literally work with people around the world. Um, in fact, I've probably done more projects in markets outside of the U.S. than I have inside of the U.S. So I've gotten to work on projects um, for Japan, France, uh, the mm -hmm. UK, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands. So it's it's really been quite uh, a rewarding opportunity. So that's great. Now I'm curious about this because everybody knows McDonald's and everybody's experience with McDonald's is the the person behind the register, right? It's it's the mm -hmm. smell of grease. It's uh, you know the mm -hmm. fries. It's burgers. Are are you working with the the sort of the ingredients, the food side of things? Are you looking at personnel? Are you looking at real estate? I recall hearing one time that McDonald's is one of the largest holders of real estate on the globe uh, because yeah. restaurants in every city. What 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 sorts of you know inputs are you are you dealing with when you're when you're doing event uh, discrete uh, event and systems modeling for for McDonald's Corporation? If, if I mean if you're allowed to tell. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Yeah, so my work um, primarily is concentrated on the restaurant property. So I'm, for example, I'm not modeling anything like supply chain related. And so most of my okay. modeling um, centers around restaurant operations. And so it would be looking at our, the, the, the production of the food and particularly, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the modeling that I do involves trying to provide you know good customer experience so so actually my group at mcdonald's sort of rolls up underneath uh what we call mcx or mcdonald's customer experience organization so there's a chief customer experience officer and ultimately kind of my organization rolls up there but we're very we're operations focused and so so we're dealing with how can we stay on top of our operations and continue to provide a positive customer and a positive employee experience, knowing that, you know, customer behaviors have kind of shifted. And you think about like all of the, everybody's got a smartphone, right? So if you have a smartphone, you have the ability to order food at not just McDonald's, but, you know, so many pe so many different places, you know, everybody's got an app. And so compared to, you know, say like the mid nineties, we had drive through and front counter, right? That's all everybody ever had. Now right. there is delivery. You can order through a kiosk. You can order through your app. You can do curbside. So there's all of these different, we basically have kind of, um, and everybody has done this, has increased the surface area of their, how their customers can order, pay, and receive their food. And so operationally, again, it goes back to the variability, right? So operationally now, you're introducing more variability into your production platform. And so how do you grapple with that variability and sort of maybe redesign the system or maybe uh, tweak the system to account for that variability and still provide the speed of service that our customers have come to expect from us. And so I just, I, I love that challenge again, of grappling with that, that fuzziness, you know, that, that variability. And on yeah. top of that, you know, like, McDonald's in France looks completely different than McDonald's in the US. And that's completely different than the UK. And so you have this other layer of variability too that is um, dependent on what market the restaurants are in. And so right. again, it's it's just a lot of fun for me to kind of it's like a big puzzle. And uh I, I love just kind of getting my hands on it and and um having having such an impact too. It's it's, it's really rewarding. It, it sounds like it's just about the one one of the most complex you know, global organizations to be involved with, because of course part of the part of the McDonald's brand, and I'm telling you anything you don't know, is is that people can expect roughly the same experience adjusting for you know whether you're in India or Japan, anywhere on the globe. If I go to yeah. a McDonald's in Sydney, Australia, I expect the the food to to look and taste the same. 
I, I'm not expecting unique surprise, surprising experience outside of certain models. So, so imagine that, that there are, you know, a fair that there, there's a fair amount of uh, limitation that's placed upon the 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 expectations and the 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 output that you can generate. You're you're exactly right, and you know that's so. A couple of fun facts for you. Uh, so you mentioned, yeah, McDonald's is actually uh, the second largest landowner next to the Catholic Church, believe it or not. So, oh, wow. So, <laughs> yeah, so for they, both. Uh, yeah. yeah, real estate's high and, and um, supply, second largest supply chain in the world next to McDonald's. We feed the equivalent of 1% of the world's population every single day. Uh, so That's it's astonishing. really, wow. This, yeah, 120 different countries, 40,000 different, you know, different stores, but you're right. Like the, there's challenge. And, and again, I, it's, you wouldn't think about this, you know, everybody has this, this idea of like, we all working for fast food company is like, yeah, it's pretty mundane, ho-hum, you know, but I have been surprised at the amount of variability. So if you do go to McDonald's in, um, in the UK or Sydney or wherever, like you will find like the core items that are the same, but you also see, mm-hmm. you'll also find culturally specific items as well. So, you know, you'll have rice and uh, like bone in chicken, say like in Singapore or China, things like that. And mm-hmm. so, but yes, yeah, how do we, again, this thing I love is like, how do we respect that cultural diversity? How do we have some uniqueness, but also be able to deliver kind of the experience that our customers have come to to know and appreciate for value, speed, and, you know, friendly customer service uh, across the board. So it's it's a fun challenge. Yeah. Yeah. This is a mundane example, but at, at a local pizza place, occasionally while I'm waiting for my pizza, I find myself wondering how the decisions are made to direct employee time to preparing food for delivery, for pickup versus for people who are in the restaurant. And I imagine all these things could be quantified and go into some kind of model. If you're at at a certain level of complexity, you would say, you know, if if I've got six employees, should I have two of them working solely on the carryaway stuff so it's ready within one minute of people walking in the door? Is is that does that that ring a bell with the kind of thing that you're doing? That is exactly the types of problems that we're solving for. You know, because yeah, think about as a customer, right? What do you want as a customer? Well, you want to show up at the restaurant. And your food that you ordered before you got there, you want it to be ready. You don't want it to be cold, you know, like yeah. that's been sitting there forever, but you want it to be ready so you can just walk in, pick it up and walk out the door. Right. And so that is exactly. And, and yeah, you're right. Like, how do we devote production resources, whether it's staffing or how do we route our orders, things like that? How do we design our drive throughs uh, to be able to handle these different customer channels? exactly the type of stuff that I am basically building fancy sandboxes to put, to play around with and, and yeah. figure out the answers. So, yeah. That's fantastic. That, that's a really, really amazing uh, sort of life story for you, the story of your career over the past 20 years. Uh, we haven't said much about philosophy and the role of philosophy in your life now, either as a family man or as a, as an, as an industrial engineer now. You studied philosophy for three years at Conception. You did engineering before, business and engineering after. But reflecting on that now, where what what sort of insights do you have that that you could share about the, the sort of education you had and its value for you now, uh, two decades down the line down the line? Yeah, I think you know I've listened to some of your previous guests, and I, I really resonate with uh, a lot of the things that others have said, and and. Uh, you know, life after philosophy is kind of a funny phrase because I think anybody that has studied philosophy seriously would, would, and I think others have said this on your podcast, but is there life before philosophy, right? You know, it's like, you're not <laughs> right. really living until you, you've you actually studied philosophy. And I would say that philosophy has really sort of permeated every aspect of my life. And I think that's that's kind of the point, right? And just the word itself. And again, others have said this, but philosophia, it's a, a love of wisdom. And I think that's the starting point. And if you are taking life seriously, I think I think the biggest thing, takeaway for me, is that philosophy really sort of opens you up to 
looking at what you're doing, no matter what you're doing and looking at who you are and being thoughtful about it and really just, just taking a stopping and, and thinking about it. And so whether it's work or whether it's family, you know, your, your philosophy enables you to sort of just stop and smell the roses or just stop and think and say, why, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why is this functioning the way it's functioning or how, why do, are these people interacting the way that they're, they're doing? And so rather than being sort of a passive actor and just go, rolling from one set of motions to, to another. And so I think that's the biggest impact. And again, starts with that love of wisdom and a big piece of that. And I, you know, is the old adage of, of first you have to know yourself, I think, or maybe it was Aristotle that said, self-knowledge is the first step in wisdom. Right. And so I think that's, that's a big piece of it as well is to take the time to figure out who you are, not just as a person, but as a human being, what does it mean to be human? Uh, what does it mean to interact with other people? And uh, a big piece of that, of course, is humility. You know, you have to have, you have to have a certain level of humility to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, this is who I am. And you can't get to the next question, which is, okay, do I like who I am? Am I, am I the person that I want to or should be? And how do you improve uh, upon that? And of course, it's really the foundation too of, of any human relation, right? And so you have human relations, obviously in the family and with children, but uh, also in the workplace. And so you start with that self-knowledge and I'm very blessed to be married to a woman who uh, is very philosophical in, in the sense that she's not afraid to look at herself, you know? So starting with our marriage, you know, my wife and I have, you know, just like any couple, you know, you, you, you have to figure things out, right? There's no handbook on marriage, right? And you have to, you right. can't really know how you're going to kind of relate to another person unless you realize who you are and who you are as an individual. And so then taking a pause to say, okay, yeah, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not uh, acting how I should be here. You know, I, I and your, your spouse is very good at, at helping, <laughs> helping you realize the, the ways that you're maybe not acting the way you should, but having that humility, having that self-knowledge to say like, okay, yeah, you're right. I need to, um, this is not what I want to be doing, not the direction I want to be doing. And then when children enter into the, to the equation, then really that's your goal is to form good human beings. Right. And so it's really helping your children understand who they are. It's helping them learn to know themselves. And so there's just so many ways to do that. I'm from, from just kind of like a, I guess a practical or more specific example, like I'm real big on virtue ethics, you know, and so mm -hmm. specifically, you know, the cardinal virtues, which, you know, we have the ancient Greeks to thank for, but prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice, like prudence, what helping my children understand, like, what is the good for you? You know, how, who are you? Who did God create you to be? What is the good for you? And then justice, you know, sometimes having two sets of twins, sometimes I feel like I'm in the middle of a giant like sociology experiment of yeah, nature versus nurture, but at well, two you, sets you, of you twins. You with five like, women, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you, they they kind of get a, a very healthy dose of, of justice. Like you, they inherently from the very get-go had to share a space <laughs> with right. another person. So and then temperance and, and uh, fortitude, you know, one of the things I think like my own personal synthesis of my Catholic education, but also my philosophical education. And I, and I um, Emily and I taught RCIA for 10 years. Like, I think my own personal synthesis of philosophy, of human nature, of the Catholic anthropology of man, the Catholic faith, whatever you want to call it, is that inside innate in in every human being innate in our human nature is sort of this tug of war match between selfishness and selflessness we all kind of have this tendency towards selfishness at some times but to really find ourselves to really reach our full action the full actualization of our human nature 
we have to give ourselves away. Yeah. And I think if you look back at sort of philosophy through the ages, that sort of tug of war match has been there. You know, it's been it's it's manifested maybe strongly on one side of the tug of war match versus another over, over certain years. But, you know, thinking back again, now tying this back again to like virtue based ethics of temperance and fortitude, it's like mm -hmm. that's that's helping us sort of be on the right side of that tug of war match and, and tending towards the selflessness, uh, you know? And, um, so like before my kids, um, uh, leave for school every day, you know, I always tell them be excellent today. You know, we're not made for mediocrity. We're made for excellence. And the, the, the word virtue has its roots in excellence. Right. And so it's like a, a violin virtuoso is somebody that is excellent mm -hmm. at playing the violin, you know? So, I'm trying to cultivate excellence in my children around the cardinal virtues, but also, you know, helping guide them through just the normal circumstances of life. And so like I've drawn, you know, I'd say maybe recently within the last several years, I've sort of gravitated towards um, certain aspects of like stoic philosophy of like, you know, as my daughters have gotten into teenage years and and gotten into social situations and stuff it's just helping them remember that their dignity and their worth is not based on social interactions it's not based on what they do it's right. based on who they are and the dignity that they have as a human person and that there's certain things that they can't control mm -hmm. so don't worry about the things you can't can't control just focus on the things that you can control and that's kind of where the, the stoicism i think uh comes into play so that's one of the best, most easily memorizable uh, aphorisms. You know, some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. And forgetting yeah. the difference between the two is 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 tragic. I, I wonder, do you still read philosophy today? Is there anything you read or sort of keep up with in, in philosophical literature? You have a favorite yeah, author? Yeah, you know, I would say, uh, so I have a, a, a real, a group of real close friends and we try to get together once a month and a different person, there's probably about 12 of us. And um, so some of the people you might know, so like Mike Armour's in that group, uh, Father Chad Ar Arnold is actually in that group too, but- I remember both of those guys really well. Yep. So we, and, and there's, there's other guys that uh, we're, we're friends with here in which there's probably about 12 of us. And so we take turns hosting uh, once a month. And uh, it's up to whoever the host is to kind of pick out a reading. And they're probably more gravitated towards theology type readings, spiritual type readings. But uh, we we do sometimes get into um, some philosophy. For myself, you know, unfortunately, I, I probably don't read as much as I should. But uh, recently for me, I'm, probably, I'm not judging you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not I would, judging it, you. You know, part of it is just the function of of you know what stage your family's at, what your obligations are, and stuff like that. But oh yeah, um, as as uh, I've gotten into maybe phase two of parenting, where it's like you don't have such little kids, and now you have more kind of independent children to a degree. I have been taking, and and part of it too for me was that you know I was in school while working full time for a lot of years as well, and so you know the I was reading a lot for schoolwork, but not necessarily on my own but i have started to read more and more and um, actually you know one of the things that uh um, i did start reading uh, a couple of years ago or maybe about a year or so ago now was uh the daily stoic right so i mentioned stoicism mm. and so it's it's kind of a it's maybe kind of a pop culturally thing now it's kind of stoicism maybe making a resurgence this guy ryan holiday he kind of just Mm -hmm. basically the format is it's a daily reflection it's got a quote from a stoic philosopher and then he sort of has his own personal uh reflection on it and i i read those in the morning and i find it's a good way to kind of anchor my day and um, get perspective I, it's part of my morning routine that also includes like uh, morning prayer from liturgy of the hours but i sort of do liturgy of the hours and then i read this daily stoic and it's been good because also sometimes I, I will share it with my daughters mm -hmm. and we'll have like a little discussion about it. And I don't always agree with like his particular take on certain things. You know, I would maybe spin the the quote a little bit differently, but uh, but it's, it's it, that's good. And recently also, I just picked up, uh, what is it? It's Joseph Peeper and it's like um, something like leisure culture. <laughs> 
culture and leisure. I can't remember the title, but basically so it's, it's gotta be leisure, the basis of culture. Yes. Leisure, the basis of culture. Yeah. So literally I just picked that up. <laughs> I, I think it was from, it may have been somebody peeper was mentioned on one of your previous episodes, but then like his name came up randomly twice I never heard, I'd never heard of him before in my life, but ran So I was listening to your podcast. His name came up, you know, kind of had a mental note in the back of my mind, but literally he came up in two other ways, like within the span of a week. So I took that as a sign, like, okay, I got to, it's a sign. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta like get this guy's book and, you know, and, and start reading. So I just broke into that. Yeah. But I, you know, frequently I, I would go back to, some of my old like philosophy notes or, 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 you know, look up some Aristotle or something like if I, last year I taught some religious, cl- actually I taught a, a faith and reason class for our, you know, ninth and 10th graders at our parish. Very and cool. uh, yeah. So, you know, as, as the situation merits, I'll, I'll go back and kind of review some materials and stuff. Yeah. Some of what you're describing reminds me of what in seminary we, we called and still call human formation. And yeah. then it occurs to me, you and I both as parents, that, that human formation is what parenting is about, right? You're shaping yeah. your children, trying to get direct them towards virtue, help them to deal with whatever it is inside them, sort of as part of human nature, as part of their unique personality profile, is going to challenge them and give them, you know, make make life difficult for them. But it, it's about becoming a good, a true, and excellent human being, and somebody who cares about the right sorts of things. And that, that's yeah. preparation for ministerial priesthood. But uh, as I've said to to seminarians, including probably to you, nobody's going to go away from this kind of education worse off, you right. know, it, it, for for having you know acquired some self knowledge. It sounds like that's been a kind of stable foundation for everything you've done with yourself, you know, with your family, and growth through your career, falling in love with systems modeling and the like. Is yeah. that does, does that seem like a fair thing to say? A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. And again, I think philosophy is at the root of that in, in this, from the sense of stopping to think, stopping to think about what you're doing, you know, when you have children stopping to think about, okay, again, I joke about kind of being in the middle of a giant sociology experiment, you know, nature versus nurture, but like each one of my four daughters is unique and different, even though they were born two at a time. And so being present enough to analyze their, you know, maybe analyze is kind of a strong word, but to 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 take their social interactions, to take how they interact with their siblings, how they interact with other people, and really just think about that. You know, I was like, oh, is this how my, is there something here that I should be watching out for? You know, oh, they, they said this and like, whether it's like, regarding their own personal self-image or whether it's regarding like this, the uh, image of somebody else or like how they view somebody else or, or, or how they're developing, like what kind of attitudes they're developing as far as like maybe, for example, their propensity towards work and sacrifice or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. um, just being intentional and like being kind of zoned in and say, okay, is there something here that I should try to do? you know, shape in a different, in a different way. And also, you know, I recounted the story of just kind of my career trajectory. Like I would not left, left to my own devices. If, if you would have told me that I would be happy as an industrial engineer, the path that I would have picked out for myself would have been completely different than the path that I took, but it would not have been as good. Mm -hmm. And so like I'll tell anybody that listen, like I, I'm convinced that because I, I have a bachelor's in philosophy, as we mentioned, and a master's in industrial engineering. I don't have an undergrad degree in industrial engineering. I'm convinced that my bachelor's degree in philosophy has made me a better industrial engineer than I would have been otherwise. And so being able to stop and think and having that intellectual humility of saying, you know, there's some people that pick something they want to do and come hell or high water, they're going to do it. And no matter how many roadblocks get in the way and okay, I think our culture values that, but my, our instant or our experience, my wife and I's was that things weren't quite working. Instead of doubling down, we kind of had the, the humility to say, you know what, we kind of need to reinvent ourselves here. This isn't working. And like, I would not have discovered this rewarding career that I had had we not had the 
wherewithal to just constantly be thinking about our situation, you know? And so I think that's where philosophy is. It's like you are present with what's going on around you, whether it's your family, whether it's your yourself first and foremost, right? And your relationship with God, uh, but then your relationship with your spouse, how you relate to other people, your relationship with your work, your kids, you know, so that's what philosophy is really is like, what is wisdom here? You know, what is, what, what should I be doing? What is the, uh, you know, whether it's a uh, figuring out how to, how a restaurant works or whether it's figuring out how your kids tick the way that they do, you know, that's, that's kind of where philosophy is set, sort of at the foundation of all of that. So. That's fantastic. I think that that's, that's a beautiful thought. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to close with, with that. And maybe I can ask, maybe make one more observation and see what you think of this in thinking of what you've just talked about with the, the systems modeling that you do. I'm thinking about the way that some people approach philosophy or sort of criticize it from the outside without taking it. They might say, the reason I'm not going to take it is because, you know, I, I want to focus on the MBA, the engineering, the career. And it, it, I wonder if maybe one way to think about this, I could try to explain this to people by saying, drawing on your experience, that people shouldn't make the mistake of expecting philosophy education to do what it can't do. It, it, it's not going to give you the, the skills, the credential, the, the practical know-how, but it is going to do what it can do. That is, it's sort of in the overall modeling of your life, of your education, it's exactly the thing that's needed at the place and time to do what it can do uniquely, which is to give you this self-knowledge, this awareness, this orientation, which then empowers you to go on and make the best use, to, to be an excellent father, to be an excellent business uh, business student, to be an excellent engineer. So it, it, it's it's a matter of sort of mismatching the tool to the task. Does that does that seem like a promising avenue of of, of talk? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, yeah, if somebody is... So, like I said, I am convinced that I'm a better industrial engineer, I'm a better husband, I'm a better father than I would have been otherwise had I not taken philosophy, right? If you are pursuing philosophy to have some sort of high-powered career as, as sort of an end in and of itself, like you're, you're kind of missing the boat, you know? So I would say pursue philosophy in the search of becoming an excellent human being. And like, I, I remember when I was in my MBA classes, I was in this organizational behavior class and, you know, so we're reading all this like modern stuff about, you know, how to be a good employee, how to be a good boss and like organizational culture and stuff. And I just remember thinking at the time, it's like, well, this stuff is nothing that the ancient Greeks didn't already say 2,500 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it basically, it just boils down to the fact that like, if you're a good human being, if you're a good person, you're going to be a good employee. You're going to be a good lawyer a good entrepreneur a good boss a good mcdonald's worker you know like if you focus on bettering yourself first and foremost then like you you're never gonna not succeed right no matter what you do you might reinvent yourself or you might have to take a little bit of a circuitous path because our world is kind of confused about what success uh looks like or what good people look like but eventually they they get it because the proof's in the pudding. Like you, you know, my career has been very much like I, I haven't had to push for my career. It's just I show up, I perform, I try my best, I try to be excellent. And like, guess what? The company kind of gets that after a while, like, oh, hey, let's this this guy's doing some good stuff. Like, let's see if he can do this over here, you know. So so yeah, that's what I would say. It's just, you know, pursue philosophy to be an excellent human being and and uh all other things will be given you besides, you know, that's kind of the story of like, you know, Solomon, he asked for wisdom and uh, God commended him for asking for that, you know, and he sort of had all the other things uh, besides that. But um, yeah, seek to be a better person, seek to be excellent and, and everything else will fall in place. So that's, that's very powerful. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for taking your time with us. Uh, our guest today has been Jared Tommy who is uh, a global operations manager, strategy and standards for the McDonald's Corporation and a 2005 philosophy graduate. Thanks again, Jared. I appreciate you taking so much time. I think we've run nearly an hour uh, in terms of our conversation today, far more than I expected, but very profitable. I've learned a lot and I think it's been really good for our audience. Yeah, I've, it's, it's been great. Yeah, no worries. Uh, 
time flies when you're having fun. It's, it's been good to, to catch up. It's been good to share with you. I, I hope I didn't ramble on too long. So <laughs> thanks for having no me. No trouble at all. Thanks again, Jared. Bye. Sure. Thank you for listening to Life After Philosophy. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate it five stars and share this episode with a friend. I appreciate your support.